I'm Chris Browning Bloss. I'm Communications Director for the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences here at CSU, where we do so many things to improve the health of animals, people, and the planet. Those things are all connected, especially when you look out the window of the International Space Station. Tonight, we will get a view of Earth from space, where our guests spent nearly six months in orbit conducting research that will benefit all of humankind and further our reach into the cosmos. Dr. Chell Lindgren, come on up. Have a seat. Awesome, thank you. Chell got his master's here in cardiovascular physiology in 1996. Before that, he got a bachelor's degree in biology and a minor in Mandarin Chinese from the US Air Force Academy. After studying here at CSU, he went on to med school at the University of Colorado. So he's a buff ram falcon. That's right. <laughs> a mythical creature. He's board certified in emergency and aerospace medicine. He was commander of the SpaceX Crew 4, which launched in April of last year and returned in October. This was his second trip to space. He's a member of the Artemis team that will return humans to the moon. And he is the only human in the universe to play the bagpipes in space. <laughs> Jessica Watkins grew up in Lafayette, Colorado. Thank you. She, she did not go to the school down the street. She went to Stanford for a degree in geological and environmental science. She played rugby there and won the Division I National Rugby Championship. Right? She earned her doctorate in geology from the University of California, Los Angeles, and she served as mission specialist on Crew 4 and was the first black woman to complete a long-term space mission. They spent 170 days, almost six months. She's been involved with Mars exploration for more than a decade and is on the Artemis team along with Chell. She also found Nemo, so you'll have to ask her about that. <laughs> Welcome, Jessica and Chell. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're uncomfortable sitting down at yeah, this, so. We're actually gonna, gonna shift, <laughs> perfect. Um, we are absolutely excited to be here. Um, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your evenings uh, to come uh, and listen as we share our most recent experience on the International Space Station. Um, the title of the talk is One Health, One Planet, and, and it really reflects the initiative that, uh, that's here, um, that's being practiced here at CSU. And that is really understanding that humanity, that the flora and fauna of the earth, the environment, are all one, part of one system. And that, uh, that each part of that system has to be healthy for, for, for all, all of it to, to flourish. And I'll tell you that that is something that resonates with us deeply. Um, as we look out from the International Space Station back to this incredible um, planet, this incredible home um, of ours, we see that that interconnectedness. Um, as we look down at the oceans and the various land masses that we have the opportunity to fly over, um, we see the effect that humanity has on the surface of the earth and how that in turn has effect on the oceans and, the, and then the landlocked water uh, in the form of glaciers. Um, we see how what one country does um, has effect on its neighbors, how humanity is cr uh, connected across the globe, um, and how we are deeply affected by the, uh, the state of the environment and, um, and the other occupants of the earth. Uh, we feel that connection. We feel that connection as a part of uh, just the team on the space station, within our crew, with our international partners, and the connection that we have uh, with our team on the ground. We have the privilege of being one small part of the, the on-orbit team that is connected with the team in mission control in Houston, 
um, with our control centers in Huntsville across the country and with our international partner uh, control rooms uh, across the globe. We, we feel that. Um, and so understanding the impact that we have, the impact that each of those teams have on our, on our overall mission, um, I think is kind of a microcosm of, of what we see as we look, look back at the Earth. I think that as we look at the Earth, there are some that, uh, that fly that will look at the Earth and feel disconnected, will feel very remote from our family and friends. But having spoken with, uh, with our crewmates as, as we have time to, to share our experiences uh, in low Earth orbit, I think we all had a sense of connectedness, um, a connection as we flew over places that are familiar to us, where we know we have family and friends, um, a connection to the Earth, uh, mainly based in the realization that that is all we have. So as we look out at the Earth in this dark void of space, um, we see our home planet as one discrete entity, unique in, the, in human experience, um, looking, looking uh, to the left, to the right, up and down around the Earth. It is all we have. We see the very thin, fragile atmosphere that surrounds it. Um, and uh, living on the space station, um, you begin to sense the fragility of what is essentially humanity's spacecraft, um, spaceship Earth. On the space station, we recognize that uh, if something breaks, that it puts our crewmates and ourselves at risk. The space station provides us with oxygen to breathe, food to eat, um, clean water, and uh, an, an atmosphere at a pressure that sustains life. We spend 30% of our time doing corrective and preventive maintenance to maintain the health of that spaceship. Again, with the understanding that if we don't do that, that we are just uh, an aluminum sheet of metal away from uh, the vacuum of space. And so as we look back at the Earth and we see the changes that, we, that humanity has had on the Earth, and, and many of those changes are for good. We see the, the effect of agriculture, um, things that we need to do to take care of our populations and our communities, but also have the recognition that there are ways to do those things um, that continue to take care of the earth as well, to prioritize the health, health of the earth um, as we are, are continuing to take care of our, our communities. And, but, but I think when we come home, we also recognize that none of us, or very few of us, spend 30% of our time taking care of this spaceship, um, a spaceship that is providing us with oxygen to breathe, food to eat, and, uh, and, and a breathable atmosphere. And so recognizing that we are all crewmates on this spaceship together um, and that we are connected and have to take care of each other um, to prioritize the health of our families and our communities, but also to prioritize the health of this planet that is taking care of us. Um, is really an imperative. And so it is, uh, it's amazing to come here to, to see the title of our talk titled One Health, One Planet, and to, to feel how much that resonates with our experience um, in low Earth orbit. Um, our connections extend even deeper. So uh, we both consider ourselves Coloradans. Yep. And so to have Colorado as a launching point, a beginning point for our journeys, um, and to have the opportunity to come back here after this flight and to share this opportunity um, is absolutely amazing. Uh, our journey started here. Uh, Jessica, I know your, start, your journey started here. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so I grew up here in, in Boulder, just down the road. Um, I went to um, fifth grade was the first year that we moved here from Maryland. Um, so I went to a year of elementary school and middle school in, in Louisville, Colorado, and then I went to Fairview High School um, in, in Boulder. Um, and I really just am, am so grateful for the, the time that I was able to spend in this community um, and so grateful for the support, the continued support um, of everyone here in this community along the Front Range. Um, for me, I am a, a geologist by trade. And so I um, actually did 
not go into school um, intending to study geology, but I think my time here in Colorado sowed a seed in me somewhere that was awakened when I got to school um, and really, really began to, to uh, fall in love with rocks. Um, and so I'm just really grateful every time I'm able to come home and, and see the, the mountains and um, just the amazing foothills here um, and just be so grateful for the community that has helped launch us um, and then support us along the way. Um, and what a privilege, as, as Chell mentioned, to be able to feel connected to you all as we, we flew over um, these communities and waved to you um, as we as we um, were, were passing over um, and just really be able to feel that gratitude for um, all that you have done to, to support us um, on our journeys. Yeah. And then, uh, as Chris mentioned, um, I am a, I, I was, I'm an Air Force brat, so I was born in Taiwan. I'm not from Colorado, but uh, I got here as soon as I could. Uh, I went to the Air Force Academy. I spent time at C here at CSU and also at CU. My wife is a Colorado Springs uh, native, and, uh, and again, grateful um, to, be, to consider ourselves from Colorado and to have such a great launching pad and a trajectory that uh, set us on a path to um, this incredible journey, the opportunity to live and work on the International Space Station. So now we'd love to share what that journey looked like with you all. So the opportunity to become an astronaut um, is not a, an individual achievement. It is a reflection of the investment by professors, instructors, mentors, family, and friends. And uh, likewise, Getting to fly in space is a, is a team effort. It is a reflection of the investment from our trainers, instructors, flight controllers, all um, investing in us along the way, such that uh, after about a year, year and a half of training, one week prior to our launch, we make our way out to Kennedy Space Center. Um, we start putting on our spacesuits in preparation for our mission to the International Space Station. Crew for astronauts getting their spacesuits on, set to launch to the International Space Station. And this is a live look inside that suit up room where the crew of three Americans and one European astronaut are completing their checkouts. There they are. They are. <laughs> the astronauts are pretty yeah, cool, getting ready to go to space, taking their first step outside. From left to right, Jessica Watkins, Bob Hines, Shell Lindgren, and Samantha Christopher Wright. Oh, what do we got here? One, two, three, four! What an amazing experience to walk out of that historic uh, building where um, astronauts before us have walked out in preparation for their mission, uh, to wave uh, one final farewell to our family and friends, and then to get into vehicles and be escorted out into the, the, um, to the night sky and to see our rocket, our ride to space, uh, absolutely gleaming under the on light. Copy, SpaceX, we'd like to take this opportunity to extend our thanks to our NASA, SpaceX, international partner teams, and most of all our families for getting us to the threshold of this amazing opportunity to launch to the International Space Station of Kennedy Space Center. Heartfelt thank you to every one of you that made this possible. Now let's let Falcon roar and free to hurry. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. And let's go. Go Falcon. We are told that watching that uh, rocket claw its way into the night sky was an absolutely spectacular experience. I can tell you riding on the top of that rocket uh, was even better. Um, and so going from zero to 17,500 miles per hour, uh, from the ground to low Earth orbit in just eight and a half minutes um, was absolutely amazing. The next few hours, uh, we're looking forward to docking with Space Station and uh, sharing more of uh, our work and uh, um, the, the amazing science and research that we have the opportunity to do uh, with you over the coming months. So thanks so much, and uh, Crew Dragon Freedom signing off. So just eight and a half minutes into low Earth orbit, and then for our crew, another 16 hours to catch up with the space station, which afford us the opportunity 
um, to catch a quick nap, have a meal, and then get back into our spacesuits in preparation for docking with the space station, opening the hatch, and joining our colleagues, our friends, our fellow crew members for Expedition 67. With the International Space Station flying 261 statute miles over the Central Pacific Ocean. Dragon Hatch is open and they are welcoming the crew for This is a ballistic entry. Okay. You see all smells around as Jessica Watkins, Bob Hines, Samantha Christopher Reddy, Ingress, and last one in we see Commander of Dragon, Chill Lindgren, now entering into the International Space Station. So the reason that we go to the International Space Station, this orbiting laboratory, is to do science. We are able to take advantage of the microgravity environment that the ISS offers to do all different kinds of science. Um, we were able to participate in over 250 different scientific experiments while we were on board. We are able to do material science, uh, so you see us, um, our, our crewmate Bob here working in a glove box um, doing material science. Here I'm working in a combustion chamber, essentially a, a furnace, looking at how different materials burn at different temperatures um, within the, the microgravity environment. We are also able to do uh, fluid dynamics, so looking at how fluids behave um, and, and the, the differences in their behavior when we remove gravity from the, the equation. And the really neat part about doing science on board the ISS is that we're able to be essentially the hands, eyes, and ears of the scientific team of experts on the ground who have prepared these experiments for us and help walk us through conducting them on their behalf. It's a real privilege. We're also able to participate in human research experiments while we're on board. So we become the test subjects ourselves um, as we're looking at the effects of long duration space flight on the human body and the human brain as well. Here we're looking um, at our, our eyes and um, doing some vision testing while on board. I'm here I'm actually working on cell biology, so looking through um, a microscope at human immune cells, looking at the aging process of these cells um, with applications to the ground for finding pathways to slow down and eventually prevent that aging process back here on Earth. We're also able to use the external environment of the ISS to do science. So here we're um, preparing the Japanese airlock with uh, nano satellites, essentially small CubeSats that are packed full of science. And what's really neat about these is that we're able to partner with our commercial and industry partners um, on this, as well as university partners. So we're able to get students involved in the science that we're doing on ISS. Um, it's uh, pretty awesome to be able to watch them deploy out um, into space from the cupola. You can see that right here. <laughs> We also were able to participate in several technology demonstrations, so helping to develop the technology that will help pave the way to the moon and eventually to Mars. Um, so awesome to be able to work on robotics um, as essentially assistance to crew members um, in the future. And then one of our favorite technologies is this one here, where we were developing new ways of growing plants on board station. Um, so we are, are looking at ways to do that without soil because soil introduces some mass volume containment constraints that are a bit of an issue. And so we're looking at hydroponic and aeroponic techniques of growing those, those crops without soil um, with applications, of course, to future austere environments um, like the moon and Mars. When we're complete with um, our science, we are able to take samples both of the scientific material that we're working on, um, but also human samples as well. So samples from our own bodies um, and preserve and freeze those samples on board station until it's time to send them back down to the ground, return them to the teams of experts on the ground who are able to use their instrumentation and expertise to, um, to further their analysis. So speaking of those cargo vehicles that uh, will bring that science down to the ground, we had the opportunity to welcome a number of vehicles to the space station during our time on orbit. Um, so on the far left is the Cygnus cargo spacecraft on an Antares rocket. In the middle, a Russian Progress cargo vehicle. And on the far right, the uh, SpaceX Cargo Dragon. And so let's talk about the Cargo Dragon first. It is unique in our fleet in that it is able to deliver cargo on orbit and then bring items back to the Earth safely. 
And so when it, once it launches, it will dock autonomously with the space station and its arrival heralds a very busy time for us as we dive in there and have to unload all of this cargo and find a place in the space station for it very specifically because if, uh, if you don't remember where it is, uh, it is essentially lost. And uh, so imagine um, a moving truck pulling up to your front door every two months and having to find a place for it. So once we've emptied it out, get to enjoy the fruits of our labor, uh, we get some fresh fruit with these vehicles, which is, which is very, very welcome. And then uh, once that cargo vehicle is empty, we start the loading process. Uh, so here, um, one of our broken spacesuits uh, is being loaded. And then, uh, just as uh, Jessica mentioned earlier, all of those samples that we have taken and frozen, we load those onto the vehicles as well uh, for further distribution back to the Earth. So once that vehicle is fully loaded, we undock it from the space station and then it returns to the Earth, slowing down in the Earth's atmosphere, deploying parachutes, landing in the water, and recovered by our SpaceX partners, um, brought back to uh, land, and then all those scientific samples and equipment distributed across the country. This is the Cygnus cargo spacecraft. So it flies up to 10 meters away and station keeps, and we reach out with a robotic arm to grab it and then attach it to the space station. Now this one was already on station when we arrived. It had already been un unpacked. And so our job was to fill it with trash. Uh, we have the, uh, the, the honor of being the trashiest crew uh, in the space station program. We, uh, we, ha we hold the record for the most trash packed into one of these cargo vehicles. We're very proud of that. Yes. Once that's loaded up, uh, we detach it from the space station and set it on a path back to Earth. And this time, this cargo vehicle will actually burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. And that's how we dispose of uh, the trash on the space station. It uh, looks a lot like a meteorite, um, but uh, one person's shooting star is another person's dirty underwear. <laughs> so be careful what you wish upon. And then finally, um, we had the privilege of welcoming the Boeing Starliner to the space station. So the Boeing Starliner is the additional partner in the commercial crew program. We flew on the SpaceX Crew Dragon to the space station. The Boeing Starliner is the other spacecraft um, in that uh, setup that will ultimately be delivering uh, crews to and from low Earth orbit. And, uh, and so this was a momentous occasion for us. The first vehicle to successfully launch and dock with the space station, the first Boeing Starliner to do that. And it really sets us up for delivery of future crews to the space station. PMA2, which is uh, where the docking adapters are on the very front of space station. And now you're entering into Starliner. So welcome to Starliner for the very first time ever uh, in space. And uh, Rosie the Rocketeer is sitting over in the commander's seat along with uh, her zero G indicator, Jebediah Kerbal. Launch and landing um, are some of the most dynamic things that we do, uh, the riskiest things that we do uh, while we're flying in space. Joining with that is the opportunity to do a spacewalk. Now, uh, the US spacesuits were unfortunately non-operational during our mission because uh, in a previous spacewalk immediately before we arrived, we had had a water leak into, uh, into the, the spacesuit. And so we had to um, basically down all of our spacesuits and, uh, and our engineers underwent uh, an investigation to, to make sure that they were safe to use. During that time, however, Samantha um, had trained with the Russians um, in their spacesuit, excuse me, and so she had the amazing opportunity to do a spacewalk with the Russians um, to activate the European robotic arm on one of the newly delivered uh, segments. And so uh, she did not have the opportunity to do a spacewalk during her first time, uh, her first mission. And so this was really uh, just a unique thing to, to be able to do that. Well, the space station is not just our laboratory and office, it's also our home. Uh, we like to have a little bit of fun. Here's Samantha uh, as Wonder Woman. Wadi as an absolutely amazing Spider Woman. Bob is Superman. And I'm Wonder Woman in my invisible jet. Weightlessness, being in this environment is absolutely amazing. And it is incredible how quickly our brains adapt to the idea of floating. And so while floating over time uh, loses its novelty, 
it never loses its fun. The ability to do things that you could never imagine doing on Earth. And then also the opportunity to see fundamental physics at work, to see a, a ball of water coalesce into a sphere, to see how it refracts light, and then to blow a bubble of air into that bubble of water and to see how that changes too. We remain cognizant of the fact that uh, we are surrounded by electronics, and so we try to be good stewards of the spacecraft that we're in when things go wrong. We never ever mess with each other during public affairs events. And as my kids have taught me, it's funny the first time, it's funny the second time. He's like our, our professional yo-yoer on space station. Oh, wait a minute, what is this? Here comes the child ball. Oh my goodness, it is a chill ball. We just need to be careful not to break the channel ball. <laughs> so we like to have fun, uh, but there's a lot of work to do as well. Our work day goes from 7 in the morning to the 7 in the evening, and part of that work day includes two and a half hours of exercise to maintain um, our bodies in preparation for coming home. So it turns out that living in weightlessness is incredibly hard on the human body. Uh, and rather than being in weightlessness, you're laying flat in bed for six months which results in cardiovascular deconditioning, loss of bone mineral, and, uh, and muscle strength. And so we have three devices, the exercise bike and the treadmill to um, maintain aerobic fitness, and this incredible piece of hardware, um, the ARED, the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, which provides up to 600 pounds of resistance using evacuated cylinders. Reconfigurable to allow us to do squats, deadlift, um, reverse deadlift, to maintain bone health and, uh, and muscle strength in preparation for our return home. Now we celebrated Wadi's birthday uh, within days of arriving on orbit, so I made her a birthday cake out of maple muffin top, rehydrated fruit, and vanilla pudding. It was delicious, it was perfect. It was really good. But it really underscores how important food is on orbit. It is fundamental to our health, that nutrition, but we celebrate, we commiserate over food. It gives us an opportunity to bond with our crewmates and to share our experiences um, during the mission. But probably our favorite place to spend time, second or even above the dining room table, is this, the cupola. It is seven windows that open up to the earth rotating below. All right, I see a large circular feature, which I believe is, are the Pinacante peaks. I've got them. Yeah, I've got the target in sight. One of the main ways that we can use the cupola is for what you just saw me doing, making scientific observation. So we're able to see different geologic features and formations, observe surface processes and how they change over time. We're also able to see um, natural hazards, things like volcanic eruptions, fires, hurricanes that, that may occur during our increment. Um, but what's really neat is being able to see the Earth from kind of an orbital perspective and marry that with our ground or in situ perspective in a very similar way to how we plan on doing science on the lunar surface here in the near future. One of the, the second way that we can use the cupola is really just to be able to connect with all of you back here on Earth and really put the human in human spaceflight. It is our way of, um, our, our means of taking photographs capturing the moment and then um, sharing that mission with all of you back here on the ground. It is, um, as Cho mentioned at the beginning, what an amazing um, privilege it is to be able to see Earth from this vantage point, be able to see how interconnected all of the uh, clim diversity of colors and climates um, and how we really are just one single ecosystem um, here on the Earth. Um, and it really does drive home the, the importance of our responsibility to take care of it. The night sky is absolutely just as gorgeous as the daytime um, from orbit. Getting to see the city lights, uh, as well as lightning storms, thunderstorms, sometimes that span across continents, uh, just absolutely incredible. Some of 
our favorite times as a crew were times where we were able to gather together in the cupola and just watch the world go by, um, really often in stunned silence at just how amazing and how beautiful our home is. We were also privileged to be able to be on board during times of high solar activity that resulted in geomagnetic storms producing these absolutely phenomenal aurora. There were times where this, these aurora even extended down to low enough latitudes that essentially our orbit on the ISS flew right through them. And so just absolutely incredible to be in the cupola and, and watch the, the aurora dance around us. It is the only thing um, looking out the window that gave me goosebumps. That may also be because we were being exposed to higher radiation at the time. <laughs> but all good things must come to an end. So uh, on October 14th of last year, after 170 days in space, it was time for us to say goodbye to our Crew 5 colleagues who had come up, hand them the keys to Space Station, um, don our suits and ingress Dragon one more time. Dragon, SpaceX, on the big loop, all hooks open. And Dragon separation confirmed. Once we undocked from station, we got one last view of our home for the past six months. Definitely a bittersweet feeling. Um, but before we knew it, we were on our way um, with, on what ended up being a very short trip. Um, it took us less than five hours to, to come all the way um, back home. And I'll tell you that it felt fast um, while, while we were experiencing it as well. Um, to give you a sense of the speed that we were experiencing, when we were at about half the altitude of ISS, we were moving at more, about two miles per second faster than the ISS, which is already going at 17,500 miles per hour. So we were definitely screaming across the West Coast, waving at you all as we were, we were coming across. Um, and when you are careening through the atmosphere, the, the most beautiful sight you can see is this four good parachutes uh, because you know that that is you're going to uh, slow down to a safe speed to, to splash down. We splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean, our first crew to do that since Apollo 9 actually. Um, and then the recovery ship came, um, SpaceX recovery ship came and picked us up using a crane off the, the back of the ship, plopped us down and then they were able to open the hatch and we get our first breath of fresh air in six months. Uh, you see the flight doc, the uh, flight surgeon in there uh, checking that we are all feeling good. We are all feeling great and so um, we came out of the capsule one at a time. We get taken over to a medical bay for a few more checks and then on to a helicopter, to an airport, onto an airplane um, that eventually takes us back to Houston, Texas, which is where we are based out of. Um, and this uh, is appropriate that the, the moon is in the background there, hinting to our next destination. Uh, but this is our first time to be able to say hello and um, thank you to all of our friends and family, our colleagues, our management, everybody who helped make the mission possible, make it a success, and were holding down the fort while we were gone. Uh, so we're super grateful that they were all able to come out in the middle of the night um, to give us the opportunity to thank them. It was an absolutely uh, amazing journey. Uh, we are grateful that that journey started here in Colorado. We wish you all the best on your journeys. Thank you for being a part of ours. Thank you. Well, I'm sure people have questions, so We'll have mics out in the audience. I can walk around with this one as well. If anybody wants to start, ask an astronaut a question. We'll get a mic to you. Thanks. I only have a million questions, but I'll, I'll give you one. OK. Of all of the science and experiments that you did, was there one particular one that caught either of your fancy that relates to our topic tonight? Sure. So I'll start. Um, we had a rodent research mission on our, on our flight. Uh, so using uh, a live animal model to uh, study issues that have impacts for future astronaut health and for, um, for health back here on the Earth. I think that is one of the, the most important parts of the science and research that we do is that um, we are 
we are doing those studies to, to extend our presence in the solar system, to support our long duration astronauts as we reach for the moon and reach for Mars. Um, but that, that all of that science uh, is also intended to improve life back here on Earth. That uh, what we study, many of them, uh, many of the conditions that, uh, that we encounter uh, and some of the um, symptoms that are caused by exposure to weightlessness have analogs, clinical analogs back here on Earth. And so studying us, studying the change that happen in our bodies and using that weightless environment to conduct basic research um, all feeds back to improve life back here on Earth. Yeah, absolutely. And, and my answer has, has similar implications, I think. So there's a, a real theme here. For me, um, getting to participate in the X Roots is the uh, plant growth experiment that we were a part of. Um, and what was really neat about that is, is kind of building that technology that, as, as Chell mentioned, will, will help push us towards the moon and, and Mars as we look forward to, to those types of environments. But there's also the applications to life, making life back better back here on Earth. So the, um, the ability to grow crops in areas where um, is not super conducive to, um, uh, the, the soil is not super conducive to growth, um, and being able to um, help contribute to efforts uh, towards food security for all uh, back here on, on Earth is really a privilege to be able to be a part of, of moving that effort forward. Yeah. And I'm, I'm actually going to stand up. I'm uncomfortable sitting down. Great. <laughs> We have a question back here in the back row. Come here. We have, I see a lot of kids Thank with you. their hands up, so we'll try to get to all of you. Here you go. Do you want to stand up? Uh, no. And talk into the mic. <laughs> How, what was the temperature in Fahrenheit on the ISS? The temperature in Fahrenheit on the ISS. It is 72 degrees every day, um, <laughs> which is awesome when we launch in April and return in October and completely miss the Houston summer. Um, so uh, there are a couple of extra benefits to being on the space station. So one is the weather. Um, two, that we don't get colds up there because we quarantine before we leave. Uh, we don't let anybody fly into space that's carrying a cough or a sore throat or a cold with them. And with no, you know, when we're, we don't have an upper respiratory infection, viruses, those sorts of things to share, then we don't get sick on orbit, which is really cool. Uh, no mosquito bites and no fire ant bites. So. We got a question over here. Sure. Um, is it okay if I ask two questions? Sure. Okay, my first question is, I heard there was something being built called the space elevator. What is the intent on that? Do you want me to do that? Yeah. So that is a really, uh, it's a really cool concept. The idea is that we essentially put, um, over time, a satellite in space that is anchored to the Earth with um, some serious uh, advanced materials like carbon fiber, uh, nano materials to connect the two. And so instead of having to launch things into space, we can actually uh, maybe use solar power and, and have something attached, essentially a motor that can then carry satellites up into space on this elevator. So it would decrease uh, how much it costs to send things into space. There's some really cool books that envision how that might work. Um, so some science fiction books that uh, I think for me is really cool because of how science fiction ultimately then informs science fact and, and kind of feeds on itself. So a lot of things that authors envisioned in the past, we are actually doing now in space. And then the things that we get to do uh, inspire authors to dream even further. And so this space, space elevator concept is one that I think uh, would be really interesting if it ever comes to fruition. And what's your other question? Um, can I give it my yes, absolutely. Um, so I have a question. How do you handle zero gravity on the ISS without like tumbling around and not being able to control yourself? Yeah, I'll answer that one. Um, <laughs> the answer is that when you first get there, you don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, so you may have seen in the video that when I came into the space station for the first time, I come, come barreling in to give my friends a hug. Um, but that's because it takes some time to get used to zero gravity and to learn how to float around and use different handrails um, appropriately to, to move yourself along and make sure that you're inputting the right amount of force so that you're not pushing off and going 
clear all the way back to the backup station, uh, but you're getting around where you need to go. So it takes some time, but um, luckily we have our, our friends who've been to space before who can help us learn how to, how to maneuver in zero G. There are some new flyers uh, when, they, when they fly uh, that get the, the nickname or call sign uh, hurricane or yard sale, because wherever they go, they leave this trail of st stuff that's being knocked off the wall and, uh, and, and creating a disaster. We but everybody gets better. You guys we were great. Did, yeah. Never, yeah. never. All right, we have a question right here. Me? Yep. Yeah. I can hear myself. I can't see if you can hear it. Um, so I want to be a scientist when I grow up, and I want to... Um, Experiment with chemicals and space. So, what is it like to um, like have that um, the space stuff? And yeah. So, first of all, I can't wait for you to become a um, a scientist, a chemist, and help us study chemicals in space. It is super important as we look to return to the moon and to go on to Mars. We need your help. So, continue that dream. Make sure that you study hard. Um, maybe come to school here. <laughs> I can't officially say that, I don't think. Um, and, and study chemistry. And, and if it doesn't exist, then create space chemistry um, and help us to, to figure out chemicals that were, will help us in future space flight. Uh, it is really interesting living and working in space. So everything that we have to do here on the Earth, we have to do in space. Go to the bathroom, eat, drink, sleep, we just have to figure out how to do it in weightlessness. And so as we do work, um, we have to figure out how to do that work safely as well. So there are times when we work with chemicals that are, um, that are hazardous. And so we have to take extra precautions because when a little bit of dangerous chemical leaks out here on Earth, um, it falls to the ground. A little bit of dangerous chemical leaks out in space in weightlessness, it can go anywhere, including your eye on your skin. And so we take precautions anytime that we're working with those hazardous chemicals. And then when we're working with them for scientific reasons, we have a glove box. And you probably saw that in the video. Um, I was in the glove box. And that is to contain those hazardous chemicals to protect the crew and then also to preserve the science to make sure that we're getting clean science for our partners below. There is a question here. There are three little boys. So I'm trying to decide who seems the most eager. I think it's you. Oh. How many stars did you see? Yeah, that was one of our favorite things to do, is to be able to, to see the stars. Um, one thing that's really neat about the stars, we saw probably about the same amount of stars that you can see here on Earth, especially if you go somewhere where there's not a ton of light. Uh, but what's really cool about seeing stars from space is that because we don't see them through the atmosphere, like you do here on the ground, um, actually the, the uh, stars don't twinkle. They don't have that little twinkling effect uh, when, you see, when you see them from um, ISS. So that part's pretty neat. But I'd also say that in the night sky, that what stole the show for me was the moon. Uh, the moon was absolutely gorgeous, getting to, to watch it set into, uh, essentially set into the limb of the, the Earth every, uh, every 90 minutes was absolutely incredible. And what was also cool, that while we were on the space station, the James Webb telescope became operational. And so as you all were watching images come back, coming back from that telescope, we were watching those as well. And that was just absolutely uh, spellbinding to see uh, um, as things that, uh, again, as partnerships um, across uh, organizations on the Earth and international partnerships have yielded absolutely spectacular images of the universe and uh, and, and we continue to achieve these, these goals uh, through teamwork. Someone's arm looks tired over here, so. How did you get the plants to stay up with no soil under it? Go ahead. You want me to? Okay. So um, I loved working with the plants. I got to work with plants during my first mission. And as uh, Jessica mentioned, in the past we've used soil. And so during that mission, we had little packets of soil, little pillows of soil, and the seeds were tucked into that soil through gauze. And as the plants grew towards the light, the roots grew into that, uh, into that soil. Now, we want to use um, this technology. We want to be able to grow plants uh, for future exploration, to be a part of our food system, to provide fresh 
uh, a sustainable fresh food source um, to join uh, the other shelf-stable food that we eat, um, to participate in our environmental control system, to provide oxygen and scrub carbon dioxide out of the air. Uh, I dream, so again, science fiction, I remember movies of like um, greenhouse modules and how amazing it would be to be able to float into a module that was just uh, carpeted with plants. And I dream of what that would smell like. And I may admit to sticking my head into the plant habitat occasionally just to smell the, the smell of earth. Um, and then psychologically, the opportunity, I think across our crew, we appreciated the opportunity to take care of these plants, to see them grow from day to day, some, something green and living in this otherwise sterile environment of white paint and aluminum. Um, so as we go towards that goal of, of the sustainable food source, um, we moved away from the soil to hydroponics and aeroponics which is much more scalable. And so that's basically using water and air mist to, to feed these plants. And it was cool um, just to see, I think there's a picture there of yeah. the root system yeah. just kind of growing out, not necessarily growing into to soil, but just growing down and being able to feed that root system directly with water and nutrients. And we had some amazing crops. We grew peas, we tried to grow carrots, radish. Um, initially we drew some wheat, wheat kind of wheats and grasses. Mm -hmm. In the, uh, the crowning achievement, at the very end, we grew cherry tomatoes. Um, we didn't think it was working. And in the day that we were supposed to harvest everything and clear those out, we noticed that there were little blossoms on the plants, probably 11 or 12. And so we asked the team on the ground, hey, can we preserve those and let those continue to grow? And uh, so they let us keep those, and we, we planted new stuff around them. And then sure enough, over the, the next couple of weeks, um, they sprouted these uh, green and then turning yellow and eventually to red cherry tomatoes. And they were looking amazing right up until we had to depart the space station. Oh. And so crew five, ah, those guys. our follow-on crew got to eat the cherry tomatoes. If there's any regret that I have about our mission, it is For sure. that, For sure. it's that we did not get to eat those. Great question. We have a grown-up with a question over here. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for the sacrifice, time, and dedication. What you've done to put your lives and your families on hiatus to collect the information. Just thank you so much for doing that for thank all you. of us. I really personally appreciate it. Thank you. My question is, because I will only know gravity here, what was it experientially coming back and feeling gravity on the body. I remember reading about the twins and the, 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 the I don't want to say damage, but the experience that one of them had being up there for so long, right? Because he was up there extended. Uh, mm -hmm. so, Close to a year. Yes, right? Um, what was that coming back to feel gravity on the body? And from the body to the mind, can you elaborate? Because I just think that would be fascinating to adjust and readjust and yeah thank you so i will just say that gravity is a bummer and then i'll <laughs> leave it to uh wadi to, to elucidate That's, is that your your uh technical it is, know, physician it is. Um, it's, it's actually stronger okay. i have stronger words but <laughs> i can't share them in uh in this environment no um so so chel could tell you um in in detail kind of from a medical perspective of, of all of your body's response um, to, to going into zero gravity, into microgravity, and also to coming back. Um, but just from, from my personal experience, um, when we um, go into uh, microgravity, so upon um, launch, um, there, is, there is kind of both the, the physical um, uh, response and then also um, kind of the, the neuro response, the response of your brain. Um, and so for the physical side, um, one thing that we definitely experience is um, a fluid shift that occurs. So, um, and of course, on, in gravity, the, uh, the fluids are able to, to flow to the appropriate areas um, within our bodies. But when we are in, in microgravity, that, that uh, force doesn't exist. And so those fluids actually um, start to rise in your body. And um, we start to feel that inside your, your head. So we feel essentially what feels like congestion um, within your head and sinuses um, for the first few days that we're on orbit. Um, some people experience some, some sickness, some motion sickness, but um, our crew did, did pretty well. Um, on the, the 
the uh, neurological side of things, there's definitely a bit of an adaptation where your brain is, is trying to understand this new three-dimensional environment, um, trying to determine which way is up um, constantly and, and figuring out how to maneuver within that space. Uh, but it's pretty amazing. To, it's almost an out-of-body experience to watch your brain start to really put the p puzzle pieces together and, and figure out how to, um, how to take in the world around you. Um, on the way back, it's, it's a little bit of that in reverse. Um, so Chell mentioned um, the exercise regime, regime that we um, participate in while we're on board, and that actually works really, really well as a countermeasures, which is good news for us. Um, we come back and our bodies are, are physically very strong, um, our muscles are strong, our, our cardiovascular fitness is high. Um, it just takes a bit of time for our brains to catch up a bit. Um, so in terms of the, the neurovestibular side of things, um, we, we have to learn how to balance again um, and, and figure out um, you know, how to make ourselves stable. Um, we, we experience a bit of wobbliness um, when we first return, but that goes, goes away in, the, in a few days. And then within weeks, um, our body is feeling 100% um, kind of up to, up to par, back to normal. And um, as, as Chell mentioned, we come back often fitter and stronger and healthier than even when we left. All right, we have another question over here. Hi, how do you manage your mental health when you're in space? Yeah, it's and a great. Each others. It's a great question. Um, so yourself and others, and I think that's that's really key. So in preparation for our missions, um, we participate. We'll often participate in expedi Noel's expeditions as a crew bonding activity, and it's during that that we really practice what we describe as expeditionary behavior, and that is recognizing that we are about to be cooped up um, with several other people and confined quarters in a hazardous environment for long periods of time. And so that process actually starts at selection. We try to choose people that we think are gonna thrive in, in other of those conditions. And then we do a team building exercise like Knowles where we have the opportunity to practice. And, and that expeditionary behavior um, is anchored by uh, two points. The first is self-care and then team care. And when we talk about self-care, it is doing those things that, uh, that benefit your mental health, um, taking care of yourself, making sure you're getting enough sleep, that you're minimizing fatigue, um, but that you're also preparing yourself for the next day's work, that you're getting up in time to see what you're going to be doing, gathering the tools, also that all so that you can um, essentially make sure that you're squared away and taken care of so that then you can start looking outward and seeing how your team is doing. And... And so kind of the practice that, that, uh, that I adopted from that was like every day thinking about what can I do today um, to be an encouragement to my team members? Uh, what can I do today to make their lives easier? And so if you're taking care of yourself so that then you can take care of your team, and if everybody's practicing that, if everybody's looking around and is like, how can I help take care of my teammates? Um, you really can't help but have uh, an extraordinary experience. We have uh, more to the kind of the individual mental health. We have an amazing team, uh, um, an operational behavioral support team. And so we talk with a psychiatrist and psychologist every two weeks before we fly, and we continue that practice on orbit just to make sure that we're kind of, we're centered and we're, we're doing okay. And, uh, and then we have this operational support team that provides things like um, movies and television uh, series for us to watch while we're exercising. So we have a network attached storage um, that provides us those, those things. Um, for me, there were several comfort shows that I would watch with my family on Earth that I would watch on orbit that just kind of, that uh, felt like it connected to me with my family. We have a voice over IP telephone system, a voice, a VOIP voice over phone, uh, internet protocol system. So essentially a little application on our laptops that looks like a phone. We can dial, if you've got a cell phone number on the ground, we could call you. And so you just have to dial nine for an outside line first. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then you can dial somebody on their cell phone and have a conversation. And being on the other end of that now, uh, it is absolutely amazing. It's super clear signal, better than when I'm talking with uh, somebody else on the earth. Um, and so that's, a, that's a, a, an incredible um, support. And then we have um, video conferencing software such that we get at about an hour and a half of a video conference with our families on a regular basis. So all of those things together uh, really support, um, I think, us from a mental health perspective um, 
And I just want very quickly, you know, we're, we've gotten really good at doing low Earth orbit. And when I think back to what our first astronauts who did long duration spaceflight had, I mean, we have made incredible progress. Uh, during phase one, when we would fly Russian cosmonauts on the space shuttle, and in return, um, an American astronaut would stay on the space station Mir. That was one astronaut um, in a crew of uh, foreign language speakers, speaking Russian language. Their only contact with the ground, they would wait um, with bated breath uh, for that one time a week that they could speak with a, a US engineer sitting in the mission control. Um, not necessarily even a friend, but just somebody that spoke English. And just to share their experiences, their contact with the families was through ham radio. So the VHF or UHF, uh, depending on, on uh, the wavelengths, but flying over directly overhead uh, with everybody else listening. And so from that to what we have now is absolutely amazing, and it makes our jobs uh, much, much easier. And I just quick add to that, that looking then to the future absolutely. as we explore further out into the solar system, that's definitely something that we are going to have to invest in ways of maintaining that interconnectedness, right? That is um, what allows us to feel not disconnected from humanity, but but a part of it and just a representation of it off of the off of the surface of the Earth. And so um, I think we are. It's an, a problem that we're actively working in terms of how can we maintain that type of um, interconnectedness and support um, for our, for for humans as we go further out into the solar system. Yeah, and just to tag on to that, um, we're at an inflection point. So we're really good at living and working in low Earth orbit, but we are looking forward to the Moon and to Mars. And so from a communication standpoint, you know, I love talking with my family. As we go to Mars, it's going to take 40 minutes for me to ask somebody a question on the ground and to get an answer back as we get further and further away from, the plant, from, from Earth. That's the communication piece. Um, we're going to have much less in the way of uh, mass and volume for, for the things that make life better now. We love, you saw the pictures. You, you heard uh, Jessica talk about looking back at the Earth. Um, if we have a window, all we're going to be able to really see is uh, the blackness of space as we move further and further away uh, from the planet. So there are uh, significant challenges from a behavioral health standpoint that, uh, that lay in front of us. And again, we've gotten really good at low Earth orbit. We need to turn our attention to some of these issues um, as we venture further away from the Earth. we got a question over here. Time for a couple more. Then we have... Right. Some media interviews and a time to uh, grab some selfies. Great. No time for autographs, though. I'm sorry about that. What food did you eat on the space station? That, so um, our food that we ate, um, we had different types of food that we could eat. So basically it falls into two categories. Uh, the first type of food that we had was dehydrated food. Uh, so this is food that um, the, the water and the, the air has been removed from um, the food gets sent up in a vacuum sealed package. And we have a uh, uh, essentially a galley that has a water dispenser. So we're able to uh, put the food into the water dispenser, put the right amount of water in there, very important, um, and then um, uh, rehydrate our, our food. And so my favorite type of food of that kind was our macaroni and cheese. Um, and Chell would always remind me to not put the exact amount that was written on the, on the label, but a little bit less. It was absolutely perfect. It took me a long time to figure out that I didn't have to put the amount of water yeah. in there that it said to. This is, I'm a rule follower. I'm yeah. like, this tastes terrible. It's too watery. It's like, oh, actually, I don't have to put all that water in there. <laughs> this is the, the important lessons that are passed down from, from previous right. flyers Super to important. new ones. Yeah. Um, and then the other type of food that we have available is essentially thermostabilized food that is um, just essentially needs to be, it's fully cooked, but needs to be um, re um, uh, reheated. And so we have a food warmer that essentially is a set of um, hot plates, and we can put our food in there in the, in the um, kind of uh, packages, and the heat from the, the hot plate would, would heat it up. And so that um, we came, came with... Uh, yeah, probably our favorite of that is beef fajita strips um, because That's we learned true. that everything tastes better in a tortilla. Um, so we had, had lots of tortillas on board as well. And my favorite meal was breakfast, um, maple muffin top, which is really the only baked item that we have up there. And then I really liked the uh, brown sugar oatmeal. Mm -hmm. um, and I have not eaten that since I've been home. <laughs> um, and then the coffee. Coffee is life. All right. 
We have one back here. Um, so I was wondering, because like you have a good view of Earth from the ISS, do you ever study like climate change and like, because I assume you'd be able to assess the like different precise like storms and like things going on at the Earth's surface? Has that happened at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, one, one thing that's really neat about the ISS is that we have had astronauts on board, um, U.S. astronauts um, on board for over 30 years now. And so that means that we have over 30 years of photo. 20 years. 20 years. Uh, thank you. Um, over 20 years, we're, we're going to 30 years. That's what yep. um, uh, extended out. We've signed the contracts to extend out to 30 years. Uh, but for now, we have a little over 20 years of um, continuous photos taken from uh, by astronauts on board the ISS, all in uh, very similar orbits. And so that means that we're able to see the same spot kind of over and over again from the unique, uh, you know, unique vantage point of the ISS. And so that allows us to track changes exactly like you're saying um, over time. And we can, um, it just adds to the data set and to our understanding of how this the surface of the Earth is changing, and the ways that um, that, that um, we might be able to, we are contributing to that in ways that we might be able to to help slow that process down. That for a long time, so here you go. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, first of all, and uh, the second, what I want to ask you guys is, did you have any uh, medical emergencies while being there, or urgencies, or any type of DVTs, or something like that, and how did you handle that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a great question. So we have a um, preventive medicine model uh, that we practice in aerospace or space medicine. And that is that um, instead of transporting emergencies onto the space station and all the attendant tools and training and equipment that that requires, we try to select um, the healthiest people possible, maintain their health in pre-flight, maintain their health on orbit, and, um, and then get them back in good shape once they return to the Earth. So that tries to minimize the severity or frequency of uh, a severe illness or injury while in space. Um, it doesn't mean that, uh, that th those things can't happen. And so over time, I think that we have learned um, what most frequent uh, medical issues that we run into, uh, for example, in this environment, dust and dirt doesn't fall to the ground. It does get collected up by our ventilation system, um, but eye irritation is very common. We see some... Um, immune dysregulation. And so we think anecdotally that uh, wounds heal slower in space. And we're trying to figure out if, if that is truly the case. And that's a big part of the immunosenescence project. Um, and so we have some representatives here from CU on the BioServe research team that actually supported that mission. It's one of uh, the things that we actually yeah, enjoyed uh, really working on. Um, down to the cellular level to understand what's going on with our immune cells that contributes to that. We have some immune hypersensitivity in that, in that uh, or hyperactivity in that many astronauts will develop skin irritation and rashes that are akin to kind of hypersensitivities. And so that's a big part of um, the, the things that we're kind of dealing with on a regular basis. Uh, we have not yet had a medical emergency that has required um, um, immediate treatment. So, Again, we've gotten really good at living and working in low Earth orbit, and our medical model supports such that uh, if there is a significant illness and injury that requires advanced care, we're gonna load that individual with their crew onto the spacecraft and return them to Earth for definitive treatment. We have a small medical kit that can deal with lower level issues, um, that can stabilize some severe issues, but that's how we're gonna take care of those folks. Now, we're at that, that inflection point. And as we look out to the moon and to Mars, once you're on your way to Mars, there is no turning around for a medical emergency. And so figuring out the techniques, the training, the equipment that's, that's necessary uh, to prepare those crew members for that long duration space flight is gonna be very important. My suggestion is to bring an emergency physician with you. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out well for us. I see a little hand over there. Do you take any showers? <laughs> oh. It's a good question. So six months would be a pretty long time to not take any form of shower. So, uh, so for each other's sake, we do, we do find ways to bathe. So a shower, of course, wouldn't, wouldn't work the same way that it does here on Earth. 
because without gravity, the, the, um, the water won't fall down on your body like it does here on Earth. And you saw in the video how water actually forms a sphere instead of um, small droplets. And so what we do instead is we have um, towels that have soap on the towel already, and we plug it into that same um, um, water dispenser that we use for food. We put water, um, hot water onto that towel, and then we're able to um, essentially scrub down with that hot towel and, and soap mixture. Um, the problem, however, is that, that that towel doesn't stay hot for very long, um, so it, it is um, not maybe not as pleasant of an experience as it sounds like, or maybe as unpleasant as it sounds like, um, but it is, it is effective at least. And, uh, and one additional feature of that system is that you have to use one towel um, over two days. And so that means, for me at least, like I briefed this and, well anyway, um, like I am very, very certain of which part of the towel that I have used. So that for the next shower, yes. like I know which part to rewater and, and, uh, and bathe with. And so I was sharing this lesson with some incoming crew members and they were like, well, why do you like need to keep track of that? And like, if you can't figure that out, then you just do you, just do you. it's all good. Um, I had a question real quick. Um, what are your roles on the incoming Artemis mission? Yeah, so we are super excited about Artemis. Um, so this is our NASA's mission back to the moon, the surface of the moon, and we are going to a new location, you know, the south pole of the, the moon, different location than the Apollo missions. Um, and then also we are going to stay. Um, so we're going in a sustainable way. Um, so we're super excited about that. Artemis 1 was an uncrewed mission that went around the room, around the, around the room, around the moon um, and back. And that was a successful mission in November of last year. And then we recently have announced the crew for Artemis 2, which will be a crewed mission around the room, a test flight to ensure that the, um, uh, the environmental control systems and everything um, are ready for, for the big show. Um, and so our, the, the follow on mission to that will be Artemis 3, which will actually send um, humans back to the surface of the moon. So we are super excited about um, NASA's, NASA's effort there and really as a stepping stone um, to, to Mars um, on the way. Um, in terms of our roles, we are, everyone in the office, um, everyone in the astronaut corps is excited about um, bringing their, their experience and, and expertise to bear and help support that effort in whatever way we can um, and, and contribute in, in in, um, whatever ways we're able to. Um, for me personally, I'm a, a planetary geologist, so I um, have done most of my research on the geology of other planets, so I'm super excited about the idea of um, sending humans to do geology on the surface of another planet, so super excited about um, helping with uh, formulating some of those operations. Mars, the moon, oh, I see one last, okay. Last, last question. Thank you all so much. I'm curious at post-mission, do you dream of being weightless? So since coming back, um, I have not dreamed of being weightless um, while I've been, been here on Earth. But about three months or so into our mission, I recognized that I started dreaming. We weren't, it didn't take place on the space station necessarily, but I noticed that everybody was floating. Um, so we must have been in space. So um, something about my brain kind of made that connection. And then I guess now um, my brain recognizes that I'm back here on Earth. <laughs> Hey, we want to thank you so much for your enthusiasm, for your attention, for sharing uh, part of your evening with us. Uh, it is a real joy to be back here, um, not only in Colorado, to be, be here in Fort Collins, which is really uh, an important, uh, important part of my um, academic journey and journey to, uh, to NASA and to the space station. Um, we look forward to, uh, to the adventures that lay ahead for, for NASA, for our country, for our international partnership as we go on to explore the moon and Mars. And uh, we are excited for the contributions that, that Colorado State is going to play, that the Colorado and the space community here. And then for all the young, uh, I see a lot of young people that ask awesome questions here. Uh, you all are a part of that effort. We need your help. Um, so study hard, science, technology, engineering, math. Uh, that is the language of space flight. So learn that language and come explore with us. Uh, and we would love to, I think we're going to have an opportunity to take maybe some uh, pictures over here with you. Uh, we'd love to do that. But thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you. you